Hey everyone, I'm Christine Gritman and this is Social. I do this show uh, every single Friday at 12 noon Eastern Time where I bring on smart friends who know stuff about social media and digital marketing and all sorts of great stuff like that. And today I have the fabulous Kathy Klotz, Klotz? Klotz? Klotz. Klotz. <laughs> Kathy Klotz guest. <laughs> Hi. Hello, lovely. Hey, Christine. Now, we have been at the same conferences 10 gazillion times, and we talk online every single day, and yet we haven't actually met yet, which is crazy. This is like our first meeting, in a sense, which is, I don't know how. We'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's so cool. I know we haven't, we, we keep missing each other, and I'm like, oh my god, it has to happen at some point that we actually are at, they're at the same exact Time. We will see each other, um, hopefully hopefully, social media marketing the world this year or something. We'll see each other one of these things one of these days. Um, so I have Kathy on because Kathy has this fabulous, awesome specialty that I love, which is about helping people bring playfulness to their marketing. And uh, so I'm going to launch right in, Kathy, and ask you sort of how you came up with this concept and how you would define it. And then we'll, then we'll dig into what it actually looks like in practice. Yeah. Well, so it's interesting because my background is in improvisation and comedy, as well as it is in marketing and running marketing teams. So Which came first? Ago, yeah. Ten years ago, I decided to leave and kind of combine the two. And, you know, it, it's interesting because if you say, um, you know, let's use humor in our marketing, that evokes a very specific emotion or a very specific picture. Yeah. If you say, be creative, that evokes a separate picture. And if you be playful, that yet evokes another kind of thing. And I think it's really the same thing. I think humor comes from playfulness. Playfulness is, I think, the most expansive way to think about it because it's not even about being funny, but if you are playful, I think your humor is going to naturally come out. And what's going to happen as a result of just being playful is you're going to be more creative. You're going to have more fun. You're going to have more ideas, bigger ideas. And I think it starts with that playfulness kind of factor. Yeah. I would imagine that the word creative probably goes over better with a lot of uh, more corporate audiences because they feel like creative is something to aspire to, whereas playful might be, you know, less serious or businesslike. Like how how does it how is the response in terms of how you approach this with companies? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting. If you say creativity, I think the hard part about creativity is that creativity is so expansive. It's everything, and anything can be creative. But I think the hard part about saying, well, you know, let's be creative, is that my definition of creativity might not be your definition of creativity, and then we're kind of like, well, I think I'm being creative. What does she mean by that? And and I think. Um, creativity doesn't have a universal kind of definition. And I think, um, so that, that, that is sort of where we want to ultimately get the tools to get to creativity. And when you explain it this way is look, your team has ideas and when they fe feel safe and playful, they're going to come up with new ideas. And, uh, if we can, if we can encourage that playfulness and that risk taking, you know, we're going to get to the really cool stuff. We're going to, we're going to get there. And if, if you help them understand that, look, playfulness is not frivolity. Play is, you know, the opposite of serious isn't, you know, or um, uh, play. I mean, the opposite of, of serious is depression. Yeah, and that's a really good point. That, that's, we're talking about people want to be playful and creative in their works. So if playfulness expands the way that we think about it, why not? It's going to get us to that same place. So how do you help yeah. people get there? How do you help environments create that safe space for their employees to get creative? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because so much of it is, you know, we talk about the tools and the games and the way of thinking about playfulness. And yet at the end of the day, like we, we all know that if people don't feel safe, they won't experiment. Mm -hmm. So I think the, it, the work is really interesting because I can tell you how to be playful in your marketing, but if your people don't feel safe, they're not going to do it. They're not going to go off and do it. So I think more and more, I think conversations of playfulness collide with, all right, how do we bring up the best in our team? How do we create a safe space? And, and I think creating a safe space means you have some rules about ideas and what can be expressed. How can it be expressed? And mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And all that stuff. And I think that, 
those are the, the types of conversations that, you know, we have to have. Yeah. Yeah. Ideas have to be allowed to fail. And uh, furthermore, people need to not stomp on them, which brings back to the whole yes and of improv. Like, instead of saying no, it's like, well, where can we go with that? So I want to hear about how it looks when you actually come into an organization and work with them. First of all, how do you how do you present it so that they say, yes, let's do this, given that it is itself such a different mindset for people. But then what does the work actually look like when you get in with a company? Uh so the way that we kind of come at it typically is, um, you know, improv's, improv is a, is a set of tools. It's the, it's the, we're going to dig a ditch. It's just a question of what tool do we use for the job. And the way that I think about it is, you know, we're, we're ultimately trying to get to trust and creativity. That's the business. That's the business imperative. It's just improv is a set of tools to get us there. So, you know, whatever you call it, yes and, whatever, you, you can even not say improv. You just say, hey, we're going to get us to this business creativity and trust. Just so happens that improv is a set of tools. It's brainstorming. Brainstorming. It's brainstorming. It's also more than just brainstorming. I think improv is a set of rules for how teams operate. I'm going to say it again. It's an operating system for teams. Nice. It's, it's, what are the rules of engagement? So how are we going to support each other? What ideas are available to us? How will we move forward? How will we decide when to kill an idea or when to support an idea? How will we listen? How we, will we make sure that everybody in the group gets heard? And we all know that, you know, sometimes there are people who are very, very um, you know, chatty and self-advocate really well. But mm -hmm. then there's people that are maybe introverted. And those yeah. introverts might have these brilliant ideas, right? But they're not speaking up because they can't, they can't merge on the highway, right? And so I think improv is, is not just games and yes and and all these things. It's, all right, let's have a set of operating rules for how we listen to each other and make sure that everybody gets heard. And every, we have some rules for deciding which ideas move forward. And that actually comes out of how we think about supporting each other on stage. And if we can do this on stage, why the hell can't we do it in teams and business? Why yep. can't we do that? Well, I think part of that probably is because businesses have this idea of being layered, kind of like if you're at the bottom, mm -hmm. you have to work your way up before your ideas get to matter. You have to pay those dues before you can be heard, because by yeah. then there's this idea that by sheer benefit of experience, your ideas are more worthy of being heard. And of course, that's not always the way it goes. A lot of times that's the way to get stuck with old ideas as opposed to new ideas. So what are some ways that um, businesses are could, you know, pull some of those more creative ideas and create an environment that's more safe for new ideas to come forward at every level of the organization? Sorry, is that too loaded a question? <laughs> No, no, it's a great question because we're all thinking it. I love that you asked that because I think it's a question that comes up a lot. We're all thinking it. And w there's a lot of ways, but I'll tell, I'll tell you one idea specifically. Um, it's, or two actually. One is how it's facilitated. Uh, somebody has to be able to say, all right, you know, we've heard from these people. Let's hear from these other people. Yeah. Um, the other thing is many groups. There's more likely to be group think and stagnation in big groups. Mm -hmm. When we break groups up into smaller groups and everybody has a chance, then we can come back together and get the, report out the ideas. Um, because introverts are less likely to feel intimidated in smaller group settings. Mm -hmm. um, and then thirdly, um, there's tools um, including like um, anonymous, like what we call brain writing. People will put ideas, post ideas on a wall on post-its. This is one example. And people vote up the idea and you don't know whose idea it is. I love so that. So then what you're doing is you're you're voting for the merit of the idea, but you're able to separate the idea from, so let's suppose it's Nancy's idea. Nobody likes Nancy because Nancy's in accounting. Whatever, poor Nancy, right? Or it's Bob. You know, Bob in engineering, and you know Bob, classic Bob. But what happens is, even if we're not aware, we may have some preconceived notions of an idea just simply based on who generated the idea. And so brainwriting anonymous um, will help us vote for the best idea without the baggage of where the idea came from. I love that. And I would imagine that um, online tools have made that that much easier to implement. I mean, you can submit things anonymously. And uh, that's something that companies could probably integrate into their uh, work together. So when yeah. you come in and when you come in and you work with companies, does it tend to be like a day long retreat? Is it like a few hour workshop? How do you tend to actually bring this concept to places? 
Right. So there's a couple different ways. Um, usually there's like a talk and then it's, it leads into like a workshop and we'll do, we'll do a facilitation. Sometimes it's a half day. Sometimes it's a full day of facilitation. Sometimes I come back. Like we'll start work together on some ideas or some – it's really less about the ideas. Mm-hmm. And it's more teaching them how to think differently. So, you know, I may come in and do a half day brainstorm, but really what it is is it's teaching them tools that the next time they have to brainstorm and the next time they have meetings and they have to come up with ideas, they have some systems in place and some ideas on how to run that so that they run better. Mm -hmm. And that's really the the thing. So I'll come back and maybe uh, every quarter, maybe as needed, do a uh, kind of a brush up. How are we doing? How's it working for you? And the goal is to leave the team with some some operating procedures, for lack of a better word, nerdy word, but some ways of thinking and acting and behaving towards each other that are are much more open. So yeah. we've so we've been talking about how the whole point is making a safe space for people to bring in ideas um, that they may not otherwise bring forth in order to foster an environment of innovation. Um, I'd like to talk also about you how that makes things more human because your whole thing is, you know, making it human. So um, in what way does that tend to make things human? I don't know if you have examples that you can share, but just, you know, what differentiates marketing that is more human from marketing that is less human in your estimation? I think a lot of times um, most marketing teams, and that's not to say that they do it with intention. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes most marketing teams are under the gun. It's just like they operate on a ROI, get this done, go get that done. What will work? What will work? So they're busy chasing what will work. And I think a team that that is more human is going to back up and say, what is empathy? How, how do we all operate as people? Well, maybe our customers think like us. Yeah. So you're operating from a much more, what do we really all believe? Let's let's get the best out of each other so that our, we're proud of our ideas. And it operates in a much more empathy-driven way. So by the time I think you're looking at ideas, you're not looking for the, what do people want to hear? You're you're saying, all right, let's let's enable teams to give their best creative ideas because when they do that chances are they're leading with their own empathy and i think there's a very much a difference in the 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 ideas that will be floated up and there's a difference i think in the way that we think and implement uh so i think you know we forget that in marketing teams and any team product whatever i was working with an hr team um recently and we forget that there's still people who want to bring the best creative self to the table. Yeah. And nobody wants to show up for their work and be made to feel like, shut up, we don't care about your ideas. Shut up, just sit in a corner and type. Shut up, we don't want your best self. And I think those are the kinds of things that have to open people up. So, that I mean, that's really what we're talking about here. We're talking about making it safe for people to, to bring all of that to the job. Yeah. What tends to inspire a company to bring you in, to to break themselves? Because I mean, I'm sure to some degree, they have to already be ready for that within themselves. You can't convince them that they need to stop thinking about the bottom line first and tried and true. Like, they have to get there to some degree themselves. But what tends to be the point at which they bring you in? What's a company that's ready to work with you? Like, how would they? Uh, so there's a couple things. Typically. Yeah, it can look a, di- a couple of different ways. Um, sometimes it looks in the it looks like a company that's like, "Hey, we're stuck with uh, you know our own ideas. We're we're looking for some creative facilitation. We need to kind of decide what a, a new vision for the team. Uh, we need to decide what you know what is our 2020 plan? What does that look like? What is our 2030 plan? I had a team reach out to me at an automatic uh, uh, excuse me an um, an auto dealer, not an auto dealer, an auto uh, maker, excuse mm-hmm. me, an auto maker um, reached out to me recently and they're on, the, on their 2030 plan. So they're already at the point of like, we realize that the way we've been thinking isn't going to work for the next 10 years. We would like to do our visioning for the next 10 years and can you help us get out of our own way? And so a lot of times it's, they want to think in a different way. They are, they've been there, done that, and maybe it's worked or it hasn't, and they're ready for something different. The other part of it is, I think there's a sense that the way that they used to facilitate um, might might not be the best way to, to move forward. 
Um, so they, they know that there's something better out there that could access more of their creative capabilities. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're willing to give this type of, of work a try. So, yeah. Are there some types of industries that tend to work better for this type of work than others? Uh, you know, it's interesting. I think that the main prerequisite is that they are creative and they're willing to take chances and listen to each other. That's really all it is. Because, you know, I've worked with uh, consumer products. I've worked with, you know, automakers. I've worked with, you know, HR groups within these companies. I've worked with product. I've worked with marketing. And the commonality is they are, they're ready to do something different. There usually is a recognition that, um, the employee experience needs to be better. And that's a really big one. They realize that it's not just marketing, 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 customer experience. Well, how do we get there if the employee experience is sucky Mm -hmm. and people don't feel creative? So they also recognize that, can we make this fun and better and not such a painful experience for our employees? But what if we actually treated our employees like the brilliant creative people that they were and we actually um, had it be fun and safe for them so that they enjoy the process, put more into it, give us more of their best ideas. And it usually starts with an understanding that, yeah, we could do better. Um, You know, that's really usually where it starts. Now, how does this principle apply to you and your own company and how you do your own work in terms of how how do you make sure to keep your own work playful and evolving? Ah, that's a great question. Um, you know, it's, it's, and we, and you go through ruts, even when you do the work, you yourself go, oh my gosh, you know, I gotta, I gotta put out content. Yeah. I think the thing about it is it comes in waves. Like I'll have creative inspiration and, uh, that's playful and I'll think of new ideas. So part of it for me is making the time to just be inspired by all the work that I'm doing. And I'm always trying to say, how can I say this differently? How can I say the same thing keep it fresh or maybe give a new story or a new perspective and it is challenging because even for me I mean you know there's a higher bar because people are like well you know she's got an improv comedy back yeah so no be interesting interesting. (laughs) but sometimes you know it's like you go no I need to revisit that and make it better but the nice part is is that if you hold yourself to that high standard I think you're going to hit it more than you won't yeah yeah I like that. So the standard to to make sure that you are constantly evolving and thinking of better ways to grow and evolve the same uh, similar concept. Um, by the way, at this time, I would like to really invite people, anyone who's out there watching, if you have any questions for Kathy, that would be great. Um, if you have any places you're stuck and you think that she might have insights, that would be great. Um, I'm going to ask you how different trainings have played into what you do, because what you do is very unique, but you can't just be a person who comes in and says, hey, I have this idea. I mean, you have a background in some of these yeah. things. You mentioned that you have a background in marketing. You have backgrounds in comedy. How do these specific backgrounds and training play into what you've created? Um, so I think it's interesting. I think it gives me empathy on both sides of it. Uh, you know, I, I understand the power of what improv can do, not just in terms of creativity, but what it does for teams. Because I think if teams will let it, it can help teams be better. Um, I like that. What, element, what elements better. of improv do you feel like could help every team be better? Oh, I just want to dig more listening. into what that means for people who aren't familiar. Yeah, listening, for example. Improv is all about listening. I think that where it starts is listening. I mean, I can't build on your idea, and yes, and if I'm not listening to your idea. And I think too many of us, and it happens, we're doing too many things. We have split attention. And we might not be listening to an idea that's right in front of us, or we may not recognize the idea as being viable because we've attached our own baggage to it. And I think, you know, remembering that good ideas do come from everywhere and listening is part of the habit um, and being able to go, wow, okay, th- not all of that idea might work, but you know, there's a germ of viability there. Let's explore that. And being able to reframe, these are really important things that I think every team can use. And I think having run teams, whether they were improv teams or just teams in tech, uh, I understand the, the, um, the des- deep desire of every team member to feel valued, to feel heard, um, the worst thing that can happen is that we dismiss somebody's idea without giving it a chance to breathe. 
And these are very human things. So I think the best human ideas start with treating the team members as human and remembering that their needs have to be represented or they're not going to give the best ideas. And I think too often in marketing, we're like, all right, come on, give us your best ideas. Come on. Yeah. Check, 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 back to work. Go, go, go. And like, you know, none of that's going to happen. None of the great ideas or inspiration is going to happen if team members themselves feel like nobody gives a crap. It starts with them feeling, feeling valued. And I, I really think it back. we have to back up in marketing. I think we're too pressured on the output versus the input and making people feel good about the input. And that's key also because redefining what a great idea means. Does a great idea mean that is the most immediately marketable and um, will result in the most immediate and guaranteed ROI? Or does a great idea mean something new and different that might fail? So I'm sure that that's a huge part of the mindset there too in terms of what is a great idea. Now, is there a particular moment in your work with people and organizations that tends to be the wow moment? Is there a moment that tends to be the particular exercise or conversation that is the moment where minds get blown and suddenly everyone's vulnerable? Yeah, that's, yes, I think there absolutely is. And here's the thing that I would say. um, I mean, I'm sure that moment happens. I mean, is there anything particular that you do, any particular element of your program that tends to be the thing that Change, that shifts the energy in the room when that particular exercise happens. Yes. And here's the thing that I would say. Great. The work that I do isn't about, wow, she's a great facilitator. It's through good facilitation that the team sees their own brilliance. They're, they have these ideas, mm-hmm. but they realize they have these ideas and the power of, of thinking differently is that all of a sudden those good ideas are elevated mm-hmm. and we wouldn't have gotten there. We wouldn't have gotten there unless somebody was willing to like, let's listen, let's take the time, let's build on each other's ideas. And it can be that simple. And so the, I think the wow factor is when you're, you're able to let teams realize, wow, we can do this. Yeah. Most teams have great ideas, Christine. Most of them do. And the reason they're not getting there is because of all the layered nonsense and all the BS and all that other stuff. So they're not getting to these great ideas. And when they realize that they are all they need, but they just have to list, you know, learn these new tools, I think that's very empowering. I think that is the aha moment. But like, how do you, how do you help moment. them cut through that? There's a lot of different exercises. The thing about improv is there's many, many different exercises. There's mm-hmm. many ways to, to do it. Um, I think the biggest thing is um, really training their brains not to, to shut each other down. The single biggest thing that kills ideas is the yes, but I can't tell you. Yeah. Um, we, all, we all think, well, I said yes. Right, but you said but right afterwards. Yeah. And like everybody, but I said yes. And I, people will argue, but I said yes, Kathy. Uh-huh. And you said, but right after it. And so I think there's a lot of exercises I lead them through where they see that. And then when they realize not only how much they yes, but, but how much it's done to them, they, re- they recognize, wow, I was saying it and I was shutting other people down because now it's being done to me and holy shit, I don't like it. Yeah. I don't like it. Oh, I was doing that to other people. Yeah. And then they're like, the light bulb goes on. And I think that's such a powerful moment because it's not about shame. It's about empowering them to make a different choice. Yeah. And about redefining instead of being about let's get to the strongest idea by figuring out why the weaker ones won't work as opposed to yeah. let's get to a stronger idea by building up how it can work and seeing what builds up the best. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And then when they listen and they realize by listening, they made the idea better. They realize that they have that choice all along. Anytime they feel like, well, that idea might not be viable. Instead, they can say, well, okay, well, yes, and tell me more about that. They can How choose could it to, work? You know? Oh, yeah. I like that. I like that so much. I don't see any comments, but then again, that could be just my system being wonky. So let's find out if there are any comments. Do, do, do. I'm not seeing comments. What's up with that? Let's see how this know. goes. I'm sad. I want comments. I love our people. Though then again, my computer's going a little slow. So that could be part of it. Oh, yeah. It could be. It could be. 
Yeah, I don't know. People are just feeling quiet. That's okay. Anyway. That's, That's all right. Yeah. That's awesome. So, 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 um, I guess, I guess we'll end with just kind of what, what is a really, really, and no, I'm going to go with a different one. Is there anything in particular you do that would surprise people that gets this out of people? Is there, is there, or even that like makes people feel silly just to break down the walls and, and make them vulnerable. Is there anything you do that kind of would surprise people is in a business training? Um, I think people, yeah, I think people would be surprised. I can't think of any one specific thing right now, but based on the feedback that I get, I would say that people are always surprised that something so small, like these little basic shifts that we're talking about can be the big things. Like it's, it's, it really is doable. And I think it surprises people that all along that they had the power to say yes to things and they've been saying no and that the reason and then when they shift to be more open people are more likely to share with them and tell them things and people will come to me and say man I started yes Andy and even my family and the difference now my kids talk to me and like open up to me and like I think that light bulb moment for me is really gratifying because I think people realize that that is a powerful dynamic not just for your business but for your life. That's so. a really, really, really good point. That honestly is going to be my main take home of today. I need to do that more to my kids, you know, not say, you know, no, we can't go do this thing you want to do. But, you know, how can we? How can we make this happen? And maybe it involves them taking more responsibility and helping make it happen. Or maybe exactly. it's just me not shutting them down or examining the reasons why I'm shutting them down. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And those type of conversations, when people feel heard and seen, I think there's a whole different dynamic. I think there's just a whole different dynamic. And I think it, it really comes down to people feeling heard, appreciated, and seen, right? Which is what we all want. Yeah. That's what I want. And this is something yeah. we can do for ourselves, too. I'm about to do some work with my company of one right now. I'm going to look at a few things, uh, a few ideas I've had. And instead of yeah. seeing why I can't do them, I'm going to take a good hard look. At, yeah. But if we start from a place of assuming that you can, how is it going to get done? Yeah. I yeah. like that. That's a great point. Yeah. I like that. Thank yeah. you for that, Kathy. Yay. Um, yeah. So this Yay. So this has been Kathy Clote's guest. Um and uh and yeah, look her up. Uh where can people find you, Kathy? Yeah, you can find me at keepingithuman.com. You can find me on all the socials on Twitter at Kathy Clotes Guest, no hyphen. Um, and you can you can either I don't know if you're going to put it in the show notes or anything. Um, I don't so really people have can show find notes. it. <laughs> people can, but I did link to your stuff these, though. <laughs> these are the show notes. These are the show notes. Yes, yeah, absolutely. But if you go to keepingithuman.com, you can certainly email me and you know Kathy at keepingithuman.com. Kathy with a K. And we go from there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Kathy with a K. And thank you to all of you who are watching. Again, I am Christine Gritman. I do this show social every single Friday at 12 noon Eastern time. Uh, next week, I'm going to be with Tiffany Lanier, and we're going to be talking about, uh, she's from Live with Tiffany, and we're going to be talking about how you don't have to be everywhere. How do you figure out where your message is really going to resonate and how you're going to best be able to put forth your special thing forward instead of trying to do all the things. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of doing a million things half-assed, what things should you do whole-assed? Uh, and I hope to see you next week. Bye!